because I'm going to show you how to make um, ring bands. So that, I know that that's fairly simple and it's not stone setting, but when you're making stacking rings, you want to make all your rings exactly the same size. So there's no point starting individually, one by one, sizing every single one. If you can make all of them at the same size at the same time, um, it's obviously a lot quicker and it's how we do it in the trade anyway. So let's say I wanted to make, <coughs> got a ring mandrel with the markings out um, on. If you don't have one of those, just put a bit of masking tape around your uh, ring mandrel to measure to at uh, the right size that you want to make. And so you can use that as a guide instead of these ones. So let's say I want to make some O. Is that O? Oh no, I can't read. That's cute. <laughs> the lines are a bit. <laughs> right, so I'm going to start with um, this is 2 mil round wire. Um, it makes nice stacking bands, that's why I use it. Um, if you have five bands, you can still fit them on your finger. If they're two mil, if they're three mil, five bands come go down your knuckles basically. So three mil is a pretty good starting point for a stacking band. And so I'm going to hold it against the ring mandrel with my thumb. And like with most things, when I'm bending metal, I bend with my fingers. So when I'm using pliers, I do exactly the same thing. You hold with your pliers and you bend with your fingers. You don't try and bend with your pliers because you're going to be putting marks into the metal that don't need to be there. So. Basically, holding it exactly the same level. Yeah. Sorry, this is a brand new ring mandrel. And when they come, they're um, covered in oil <laughs> to keep them not rusty, meaning it's a little bit slippy right now. So, there we go. So, once you get stuck, so I'm just going to keep going and I'm basically going to make a coil with all the ring. Oh, ring so, it would do. Oh, hang on, that's, that's a good point. So I normally do it so that I tuck tuck the coil underneath, so that my coil, as I'm making it, is going to be shooting upwards, so it's not going to be getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I can keep lining things up on my O. So still on my O, going round. And to make three bands, I want to go around so there's three plus an overlap. So what I do is I wait until this, I keep going until there's four um, strands that I can cut through. So that is a coil and it's got four strands at the overlap. Okay, so I've got my coil of metal. I want to make three ring um, bands. So I've got a coil that has four um, bits on the overlap and I'm going to hold it against my bench peg. So it's quite important when you're cutting ring bands in general um, that you're not squeezing together. That you're just when I, when you're holding a ring, you're holding it down on the bench peg with downward pressure. And although it looks like I might be pinching, I'm not pinching. Okay. I do this with my fingers either side because if you can see, I generally cut. My, if you can see on the zoom, I cut my finger at that angle all the time, and that's because my fingers are in the way. So in general, I try and keep my fingers either side of where I'm cutting because that is easier and then cutting your fingers all the time. The next thing that I do, oh, it's a bit too into mine, is I use the side of the V that is cut into the bench peg as a guide to keep my saw blade nice and still and upright. So, your, your, ben yeah, your bench, I oh, know, tips, tips galore. That's why they're there. These bench pegs are your tools and you customize them to however you want. So, I'm, this one's not very well be cut, so I have to say. But you use the side of the V as a, as a guide, keep your saw blade nice and um, up, um, still until you've got enough of a groove where you can just start cutting completely. So, because I'm cutting through this entire coil all at once, I should have the same angle on every single end of the, my, my wire um, all the way through. So they should join up really nicely. So this is the same process that we use just on a much smaller scale for um, making jump rings. So we've got a ring band. We've got ring bands um, that obviously have a jog in them each way. So we want to join that jog up and it, we're going to do it in a really similar way that you'll close up a jump ring. So I'm going to use my fingers and I'm going to use um, because pliers put marks in your metal, so if you've got strong enough hands, use your hands for everything, they're tools as well. <coughs> so I'm going to do this thing where you kind of push it either side to tighten up the joint. 
so that when you put, snap it together, it kind of snaps together. And then I'm going to line it up. So I'm going to line it up. Sorry, this is this is the camera, isn't it? I'm going to line it up that way in that direction so that it's in line. Is that in line? Yeah. And then I'm going to line it up in that direction to make sure there's no jog, jogs in any of the joints. And then I don't know if you can see on the camera. I don't know how close I can get with this. No, that's not in focus, is it? Um, there's basically, oh, is it not? Oh, is it all right? There's a little, the joint is actually a V shape. It's not a nice uh, joined up straight line. So I always check my solder joints. And if you can hold it up to the light and you can see daylight through it, it's not tight enough. You need tight joints for soldering. Um, so that's one of the first rules of soldering. Tight joints, tight clean joints. So to get a tight joint on a ring band like this, and I do this for all of my ring bands pretty much once I've bent them round or anything, is I cut through the joint again. So again, I'm going to do that funny little position with my fingers so I don't saw into it. I'm going to use the side of my, the V of the bench peg as a guide. I'm going to start by going up and then I straighten up, get it central. My fingers in the way. Not quite. And I cut all the way through. Okay. So I've straightened up the joint now because I basically there was a V-shaped joint and I've basically sawn out this little bit so it's got closer together and it's closed up. We've got a nice solder joint. Here's one I made earlier. <laughs> so this is three, these are three rings that I made earlier. I don't like the third hands, so I'm not going to use that. So the next step is to solder. So I've got, um, I've got my joined up ring here. I am going to set it up so that my solder joint is at the top here and I'm going to hold it in my reverse action tweezers and I love reverse action tweezers because once you let go it holds it there's no like having to stand there with a shaking hand holding it okay so uh, so I talked about solder joints didn't I so I'll cover solder joints just in a bit more detail so the first thing you want is you want it to be really tight because solder when it, if, it, if there's a gap solder will flow into one side and not the other you also want your solder joint to be clean. So sawing through a joint is clean. If I left that for a month and it tarnished in that, in that joint, thank you, it wouldn't be clean. Other things aren't clean. If you put your fingers all over it, that's not clean. So you need it to be clean. So if, you're, if you've been handling something that you're then gonna solder with your fingers and the natural oils that you've got in your skin, um, clean it with washing up liquid. So oh, clean. The other way to keep things clean is using flux. So flux basically protects the solder joint from oxygen, which in general makes that kind of sooty oxide kind of um, coating, um, which um, the solder will only flow where, where it's clean. So you can actually control where your solder goes by keeping it clean by putting flux there. So if you don't want your solder to go everywhere, only put the flux on the bit that you want it to go on. You can control where your solder goes by doing that. So, we're going, oh no, they haven't it. Oh no, oh no, they haven't. Oh well, okay, so, it's just gonna be a bit trickier to show you how to cut. So, with, um, with solder, can you see it's a bit yellow? It's tarnished, really. You want clean solder too, you don't, don't want just clean metal. So, a good way to do that is use your, the side of your snips and you scrape your solder clean. So, a lot of beginners that I teach have a lot of problems with their, uh, the main reasons that they have problems with their soldering is that they cut their pallions last week and then they're using them this week and in that time frame they've tarnished. So you don't want to cut too many pallions, sorry, squares, little squares of solder ahead of time um, because once they're tarnished it's really hard to clean them once it's a tiny little square whereas when it's in the strip you can, you can clean your, your solder strip quite easily. So I'm just going to clean this up by scraping the tarnish off and then ideally it would be rolled to make it a bit thinner. You don't have to but it just makes it easier to cut with snips. Um, so if you don't have a roller you can actually hammer it out, give it a good bash and it will be a bit thinner. So the way that I cut solder is I cut my strip into a little Bronze. I don't know, it's like a fringe, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's a little fringe, like that. And then, sorry. I usually have 
usually have all my tools and my tools. Oh no, hello, hi. Hey, let's Thing off. If anyone ever wondered what my favourite tool was, or my students already know this, these are parallel pliers. Ooh. These are amazing. So, normal more normal pliers have a scissor action, so they grip more at the bottom than the top. These are parallel. Uh huh. So, do you know what they're good for? <laughs> Squishing things. <laughs> I want to make it flat. How do I make it flat? I squish it. I want to hold something that's round. How do I hold something that's round? Oh, it's parallel pliers. <laughs> That'll hold it. <laughs> so, I love parallel pliers. And you can do all sorts of things. Like, you can check if things are straight by doing that. You can straighten things up. You can twist. Or I just literally love these tools. So, I've squished my um, solder flat. That's just so that I can, um, I can snip it a bit, a bit better. So, when you're snipping solder, do you often get bits flying everywhere? This is how you don't do that. So, you put your tip against the end of the fringe, like this, and then you cut along the side of your finger, like that. So, not into your finger, obviously, that would hurt. Along the side, sorry, I'm going to turn that. And obviously, this isn't um, rolled, so it's a little bit trickier. Okay, and you keep your snip pressing it against your finger and then you peel it off to the side. Can you gently put your solder pollens down? So that's how to stop solder pollens flying everywhere when you snip them. I'm going to try and go for some smaller ones than that, but this is a roll, so that is pretty tricky to do. There we go. Okay, so solder pollens. Pick it up with a flux brush. That means that you put flux on your solder pollen as well. So that's clean now as well. And we put the, oh, no, I lost it, sorry. Just dab it or stroke it to get it on. You want to position your solder pollen so that it's in the middle of that joint, approximately. Then, in general, no, don't worry. In general, I usually have a spare pair of tweezers in this hand and um, just to poke and prod if I need to. So, really bright. Um, in general, with these torches, with the micro torches, I have the air hole completely open. So, if you've got a flame that has a yellow tip on the end and looks more like that, it's not going to solder anything, it's not going to be hot enough. So, open the air hole. Different ones have different systems, but basically, there's an air hole here. Have it fully open, and you get a light blue cone. The hottest bit of the flame is about half a centimetre to a centimetre in front of that. So if you're getting any closer in, it's not as hot as it could be. And if you're getting further away than that, it's not as hot as it could be. So, soldering. What I do to begin with, because flux kind of puffs up and goes like, a bit like Rice Krispies, like puff wheat, um, it puffs up. So I gently wave the flame. I call this tapping. I tap the flame on and off the solder. And it, see it's all puffing up, the solder's moving around. Once it's all puffed up, you can melt it back down again and you can actually hold the heat on there longer. So now I'm holding the heat on there longer and I'm trying to heat the whole of the ring. So I want both sides of the ring to be hot. The other way that you control, you can control where solder flows is by using heat. So you want both sides equally hot. If there's a side that is hotter, the solder will flow towards the hotter part of the ring. That's why you want to heat the both sides of the ring. So if you're getting solder that's jumping to one side and not crossing, there's going to be two reasons. Either the gap is too big or one side of your ring is hotter than the other. Just started to ball up into a little ball. So we're almost there. The solder is at melting temperature and now we're just going to get the ring up to soldering temperature too. So this torch is um, slower than my... It's really slow. Let's try this one again, not my usual one. Okay, this one looks like it might be a bit hotter, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna back off a little bit with this one. Yeah, that's nice and hot. Okay, so can you see that the flame is going slightly orange? I know the lighting isn't great here, so okay. The flame is going slightly orange beyond my metal. That is usually a sign that your metal is at a kneeling temperature. So, soldering is just beyond annealing temperature. 
it's either the flux burning off or it's a kneeling temperature. And for this one, it's a kneeling temperature. So if you get an orange tip to your flame rather than the traditional yellow tip, mm -hmm. um, your metal is at a kneeling temperature and soldering temperature is just beyond that. There we go. Can you see that? That's just sunk down. Got a bit of a flow. There we go. Nice and molten. Done. So, that's how you solder your band. You clench it. It's hot, hot. So it's obviously all, all um, dirty now, so it's going to go in the pickle. And then, <laughs> okay, when you've got a warm pickle bath, about five minutes, depending on the strength of your pickle, and you're done. But here's some I made earlier. So, here, here's a set that I made earlier. So what I did after I got it out of the pickle was I filed the excess solder off using just a normal hand file, cut two. Um, if you're buying files, please put handles on. Um, I'm using this because they're not allowed to put handles on or something down here. Um, but uh, you can quite easily damage your wrist if it snags, so please put handles on your files. Don't use them like I'm... Don't do what I'm doing. Do what I say, not what I do. <laughs> yeah always doing that too. So I've got three rings prepped, I've filed the excess solder off and the next thing that I want to do is set up my tube. So here's a lovely bit of tube. I've got three three sizes of tube and I've just pick, literally picked them on um, to be appropriate for the size of stones I've got. So the size of stones I've got is a uh, three mil, four mil and five mil and unfortunately I haven't got it written down what I ordered on the tube but it's probably off the top of my head, about 3.5 outside diameter, 4.5 outside diameter, and 5.5. So I've gone for 0.5 of a mil outside diameter, bigger. So when I when I set into these, I will end up with a 0.25 millimeter lip all the way around. It's not very much. If you can get more, that would be great, but you don't want so much that you have no seat to put it in and your stone just slips right through the the tube so you can only set certain size stones with certain size tubes so you need to match them up appropriately so to use a bit of tube first of all I want my tube to be nice and squared off what we call squared off so I'm going to do that I do it by eye if you're clever enough to use a tool that find a tool that does that for you brilliant let me know about it and um, the other thing that you can do well, I'm not going to do the whole lot but your bench peg is customizable is your tool as well so it, it although it's in it's sacrificial I love putting for instance a little notch into this part of my bench peg because I can jam all sorts of stuff into this little notch to stop it sliding and slipping around so nice little little notch there that's how I hold a ring jam it in there and then I just push against it and it holds it nice and steady and trying to, instead of trying to hold it steady like this. I also jam bits of tube or round wire in and it keeps it upright and you can push against it then for things like filing like this. Whereas when it's on a straight edge, it rolls around all over the place. So, little bench tips. So I'm just going to do this by eye. So I'm try basically trying to make the end of the tube perpendicular, so at right angles to the edges of the tube, the sides of the tube. Then I can use my dividers um, to mark out the length of tube that I want, so I can't exactly remember how long I did it, but I, here's one I prepared earlier. So I'm going to use this as a guide, so I'm just going to adjust my dividers until the points touch each side equally and then I know that that's the measurement for this bit of tube and can you see yeah good and um, I use the edge that I've just filed that is perpendicular as a guide so I have one tip of the dividers against this edge here and then I stroke make a little mark with the other end of the dividers and this is what dividers are for you get you can set a measurement and get an equal measurement or either all the way down a strip of metal or, um, or along an edge of metal like we're doing here I'm gonna go all the way around just because I can show you so I'm literally just rolling the tube as I'm making these little marks okay and then cutting in general it's quite nice to have a little groove that is um, across your bench peg like across here like this that you can rest things like wire and tube into 
um, so then it doesn't roll them out round as much. Um, if you don't have that, then just try and use your fingers and again pushing down. So the, the, the um, stiller that you can hold your work, the more accurate it will, you'll be, the less saw blades you will break, all of that stuff. So it's really important. Um, and it's the thing that most of my beginners struggle with. Yeah, in general, if you're using your tool in your right hand, you're using your left hand for holding things still. And that requires quite a lot of strength and steadiness that you probably haven't practiced with. But it does come eventually. So keep trying. <laughs> so, cutting tube. Cutting in the side, but eventually once it's gone down the tube, I will be cutting top and bottom kind of thicknesses at once. That's when it starts to get a bit snaggy. You can hear it differently. And then eventually you get through to the side of the tube again, it gets a bit smoother. Oh, this saw blade, this saw frame is lovely. Yeah, uh, I'd lost the bit of tube. Is it? Nah, bugger. Oh well. Never mind. Here is one I prepared earlier. So I'm just going to move on to the next bit of tube. Actually, what I should have shown you beforehand, which would have been a perfect example of what not to do first, it's loads easier if, after you mark out your length of tube, you then file a groove, the groove in then. Rather than trying to hold still a tiny length of tube, we're then going to file a little groove in so that when we put it against the ring band, we've got more contact area for the solder to stick. Firstly, it gives us a little bit of placement, so it's got a little, it, there's a little ridge for the ring band to sit into, but secondly, it gives us more contact area. If you're trying to solder against something that's completely round, if you imagine something straight going up to something round, it's only touching at a tiny little point. If you make a little groove, I don't know whether you, it's not very big. Can you, can you see the groove? Does that even look like anything? Can you see it there? Yeah, just tiny. You don't want it to sink too far because if it goes too far, then your stacking rings are not going to sit nicely together. How much did you use? Just like a. I use needle file. Second favourite tool yeah. ever. <laughs> so, a round needle file. So, I'll show you now. It's much easier to do it while you've got a longer length of tube like this. So, I've marked it out and now I'm going to use my. Um, my, my uh, needle file, so, ooh, it's different, it's different, it's different. my bench peg is different. So, I'm going to use the side of my thumb, I know, sorry, I'm, quite, I'm totally crowding out now, but I use the side of my thumb, I'll take my thumb as a guide, basically, so that I'm getting a nice straight line that's going across the middle of the tube. So once I've started it off, I can show you, there we go. And we're doing things like this, you want to make sure you turn it, because needle files are tapered so you've got a wider end and a, th a, a thinner end so you're not going to be putting as much of a groove in one side than the other unless you just turn your tube and then do it so I should have done that and then cut through now here's one I prepared earlier <laughs> so here's a set of tubes that I've already got their grooves cut in I haven't done anything with the other end yet and um, I'm gonna wait until it's on a ring band before I then file off the top of that the tube to make it level because it's really hard to hold a tiny bit of tube and although parallel plies are amazing it's not from there they're probably not that good so the next thing is soldering so the, the technique we're going to use for this I'm going to show you on the biggest one because hopefully you can see that the best is that can you see it the best it'll take oh yeah we're back on that thank you <gasps> camera woman extraordinaire and yeah. <laughs> um, we're going to use a technique called sweat soldering so it's basically how to attach small things to large things. It's the same technique that we would use uh, for attaching an ear post onto an earring. And it basically means that you are limiting the amount of heat that goes into the smaller thing so that you're not going to melt it whilst you're heating up the bigger thing to the right temperature. So this is what, what can go wrong for a lot of um, people when they're trying to attach ear posts to earrings. You melt the ear post before the solder's melted, that kind of thing. So we're going to do that. So first of all, my handy ring is going to get set up in my um, reverse action tweezers again and I'm going to make the um, the existing solder joint is at the top so it's away from the new solder joint that we're going to create and um, in general that's best practice that your solder joint is kind of at the back or at the side of your ring it's never at the front of your ring because especially with solder uh, silver solder it tarnishes quicker than 
normal silver, so it will become visible eventually. So we're holding it. The next thing we do, obviously, is flux. So I'm going to put a tiny dab of flux inside that groove that I filed in. I don't really want it anywhere else because I don't want the solder to be touching anywhere else because if it does, then it'll go everywhere. So, and I'm going to solder my existing solder joint. That protects your solder joint. So if you're not doing that, then you're probably going to be overheating your existing solder joints and making them more brittle. So if you're ever doing a second solder joint on a piece, you need to be protecting your first solder joints. And I'm going to put a bit of flux where I want to attach the ring to. Okay, next thing to do. Mm. I, oh, sorry, I'm putting that in my mouth and it's not even mine. <laughs> if Daisy hasn't got germs. Oh gosh, she does. <laughs> I'm gonna try and snip some really tiny bits of solder. So that's, again, this is easier if you've got solder that is thinner or has been rolled. Same solder. Same solder. So, yes. Solder choice is an interesting one. Um, in general, because my solder joint is on the other side and I'm protecting this solder joint by using my reverse action tweezers that are steel and it's going to keep the heat away from that solder joint, I feel like I can use hard solder again. If I was soldering really close to an existing hard solder joint, I would probably use easy. So... In general, use hard for as many solder joints as you can because it's not harder to work with, it's actually harder as in it lasts longer. Um, it's less brittle, it's not as soft, and if you ever need to do a repair, that's when you drop down to easy. If you've already used easy, I mean, you've only got extra easy to go to and extra easy is horrible. <laughs> so yeah, in general, use, use hard solder as much as you possibly can um, get away with. Okay, so. Oh God, I mean they're not that small. Right oh, there, they're better. So, tiny dollop of solder, small as you can get, in the groove on one side. Uh, sorry, I'm picking and choosing the smallest bits. Another one on the other side, and the groove on the other side. Okay. Okay, so, first of all, totally ignoring this for now, except I'm holding it, I'm gonna heat the setting. So, sweat soldering basically involves main, melting solder onto the smaller piece. That is the whole basis of the technique, really. You melt your solder, okay, that's already gone. That was quick. Um, onto the smaller bit of metal. So if this is an earring post, I would melt the solder onto the end of the earring post. The next bit of the technique, clear some space, is to heat the larger piece. It is not in contact with the smaller piece. If you heat the larger piece with the smaller piece attached to it, you're going to melt the smaller piece before the larger piece. So if this was the other way around, if for an earring, for example, I would have the earring placed in my tweezers, and I would have the earring back on my on my block, and I would be heating the earring back, not the earring that is on the block right now, rather than heating the earring back. Okay, so I'm trying to get it up to a kneeling temperature. So again, can you see the orange flame that's in the background bouncing off the back of my ring? That means my ring is about at a kneeling temperature. So once my ring band, the larger piece, is at a kneeling temperature, I then gently introduce them both together until the solder's run. I hold them while it cools, and then I crunch. Okay, so, setting. Ha, ah, finally! <laughs> the bit that is actually advertised. So, oh, ooh. Can uh, anyone see a wedge of wood that's meant to go with this? No, don't worry, I'll have to open a new one. I think it went with the other guy that was here. Oh, no, you did. He scooped it. Yeah. He <laughs> might have tied it away. Right, we'll start again. So, ring clamps are really good 
I don't know. Are they an alternative to parallel pliers? Not really, but they're pretty good anyway. So, uh, ring club oh, is how you hold, um, traditionally how setters hold things steady when they're setting. So, um, there's different types of ring clamps. This is a wedge type. You can get um, uh, clamp types that basically open and close um, uh, using a kind of uh, screw and thread, nut and thread type, um, ring nut and thread type thing. I use the, um, the wedge types don't know why. I find, them, I find them easier to open and close so I can adjust things better. So, I'm going to show you setting using, we'll go for the largest one. At the start. So, putting something in a ring clamp, you want to position it so that it's nice and upright. Put the wedge in the bottom, give it a couple of taps. Okay? I'm going to use a um, setting burr. You can use a setting burr that's appropriately sized for the stone. So I'm going for a setting burr that is exactly the same size as the stone. So this tube is going to accept a 5mm stone, so I'm using a 5mm setting burr. So setting burrs are the ones that look like a kid would draw a house. Okay? Straight sides, pointy top, like a little hat. These are basically used this way up to create a little seat in the metal that your, your stone is gonna sit on. So you want this to go in nice and straight, otherwise you see, your stone's gonna sit wonky. Um, but it also means that we're gonna have a thinner lip around the edge of the ring. So when it goes into the tube, it's gonna cut a little bit of the tube out. So we're gonna have a thinner edge and then a little seat. So the stone's gonna sit onto the seat and then we're gonna have this thinner edge that we can, bend, we can push over the top. Okay? So faster, how do you press it? Faster it goes. Fast, slower, 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 slower. Okay, so um, they have, in general, a flexible shaft is really handy. You can kind of hold it a bit like a pen. Um, and I like them much better than things like Dremels and stuff. Um, I find Dremels really heavy in your hand and you get a bit of vibration with them as well, whereas these are pretty light in your hand. As long as you've got a nice flexible shaft bit, um, you can kind of wiggle it around all over the place. And then altering the height and the where your uh, clamp uh, stand is positioned and um, makes it easier and harder for you to use it. So if I was left-handed, for example, I'd have it on this side. If I was taller, I might have it a bit taller. If I was shorter, I might have it shorter. And if it was, if there seemed to be too much cable, I'd lift it higher. If there wasn't enough and I couldn't get around easily, I'd make it lower. That kind of thing. So using a ring clamp and. Um, a stone setter would actually have a different shape cut out of their bench peg. They would have a semicircle cut out of their bench peg because a ring clamp fits in really nicely into a, into a um, semicircle and they can hold it still. Luckily this V cut is wider, but, um, wide enough to put the ring clamp in. Normally if it was narrow you can just jam it in. If you're going to do a lot of stone setting you might want to think about getting a separate peg that has the semicircle cut out. So I'm going to hold the setting nice and upright and I'm also going to hold the pendant motor with the setting bow nice and upright. Can you see I'm using my fingers as like a little tripod to support it and I'm just going to whiz really slowly so I'm using the existing hole in the tube as the cent uh, centering up point and I'm just going to go really slowly um, and it's just going to lubricate it a bit so it doesn't make that horrible. <laughs> okay, so every now and then I'm going to keep checking how uh, deep the um, the seat looks to be. So basically, I don't know if you, oh, I don't know whether you can see. Uh, can you see like a little a little shelf on the inside? Uh, a little shelf. Sorry, it's metal shiny, so I can't see that because it's just blue to me. But if there's, you can see a little shelf on the inside. You want that shelf to be low enough that when you look at your stone, your stone can sit into it and there'll be enough metal to go over the top around it. So, in general, when, stone, when you get a stone, they're not necessarily going to have a complete point on the edge. There's actually a thickness 
to what we call the girdle, the edge of the stone that's going to fit in there. So you want your seat to sit, you, you want your stone to basically almost sit so that the table, which is the flat top, will be at the top of the metal. So we want the seat to be the thickness to the bottom of the girdle, so about, uh, I don't know whether you can, uh, can I, can I show that with my fingers? No. <laughs> uh, no, I can't. Uh, can I hold it on an edge? Yes, just about. So, you can see the girdles here, and the table of the stone is actually the thing of my, uh, the flat of my hand. So I want the seat to be that much lower than the top of the cheek. Okay. So, again, just gently, gently, and keep keep checking. When if you go too far, it it's actually not too much of a problem with these um, tube settings because you can just file it down a little bit. Um, unless you've got an exact particular height that you want the stone to be set at. The main thing that you definitely want to make sure you're on for is that it's sent your hole, you're drilling centrally. If you're off, then you'll be getting one thin side and one thick side, and that's not ideal. So when I'm when I'm lining it up, I'm lining it up so that it's absolutely straight. If I'm going off at an angle, I'm going to end up with one thick side, one thin side. So that's the bit that's really important when you're holding your pendant motor tube and tool. Everyone see? Uh, can I get the shine on that? Can everyone see the seat inside the tube? I can't see any of that. Does it look like there's a yes, step? In, there's a step. <laughs> basically, there's a step inside the tube. I'm going to go a little bit deeper. Right, so I've got um, I've got a seat set inside. I've also got loads of junk and oil in there and dust, so I want to clean that out. Ideally, I'd use a clean brush. <laughs> I'll just use a satin brush for now. <laughs> so, I'm going to drop the stone in. Basically, once you drop the stone in, it can get jammed and it's quite hard to do it, so you don't want to necessarily keep testing it and getting it out and testing it and getting it out. So. Okay. So ideally most of that junk uh, dust will come out um, when we ultrasonic, but the main thing that we want to get the dust out from is the little seat. So we want the stone to sit in nicely. So. Ah. Okay. 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 Can we see uh, that? I don't know whether you... I, can't, I literally can't see anything on that camera. I'm just at the wrong angle for the TV. So. When we're setting a stone, we want to make sure that the, ta the seat is nice and straight and the table is nice and straight as well. So everything's flat before we start setting. And then what I use is I use a flat square pusher. You get lots of different shaped bezel pushers and stuff and burnishes, burnishes us for the end point. We want a stone pusher and I use a flat square one. So it's got a square end flat like that. And when you are setting, you want to do it nice and controlled, the handle in the palm of your hand. So the force is coming from the handle and the control is coming from your thumb and your fingers. And you basically start, can you see? Sorry, I've got grubby fingernails, jeweler. Um, can you see that I've started with the stone setter at the side and I'm basically gonna roll up. Okay? And then I'm gonna do north, south, east, west. So I'm gonna turn it. I'm going to go in from the side and roll over. Then I'm going to check that my stone's still level. Yeah. So I'm doing east. And then I'm doing west. Okay. So I've basically got a little uh, square. Can you see? I can't. I can't see with you. Can you see that? I've got a square. So then I'm going to fill in the points, the gaps. So, uh, north, south. North, no, North East, North West, oh god, I'm not very good at that. Yeah, the in-between bits anyway, yeah. So I'm going to do the in-between bits. So the reason you work opposite is that if you push the stone one way, then you're pushing it back the other way. Once it's kind of jammed in on three, two corners, 
I've gone a bit deep for this one because of all the cutting out. I'm then going to roll it over for all the rest of it. So I'm making everything nice and smooth. I've gone a bit deep on this one. That'll be because I was rushing. It'll be a brilliant version of what not to do. If you've gone too deep, this is what it looks like. Basically, I'm covering over the stone a bit too much. I would want more stone to be um, on show here. So you could have taken a bit off the. I could have taken a bit off the top before I did this. Yeah, absolutely. When you put it in there, you want the top. You want to be able to see just about see the top of the table above the top of the thing. So you want this. That's why you want the seat to be just below the height of the table plus the girdle. So just above the height of the table plus the girdle. So I've gone a bit low on this one. So I pushed it all the way around. So that stone is set now, but I want to neaten it up. So use a burnisher. So burnishes work by being highly polished. So if you have a burnisher, protect it. Don't put it in the same pot as your files, for example. You want this nice polished surface. If it's not very polished when you get it, polish it. And what we do, burnishing, is when we smooth um, metal and make it shiny by basically rubbing it with a shiny steel bit. So it's the same uh, process that a uh, bar barrel polisher <coughs> uses to shine things up. It's exactly the same, but we're doing it by hand. So this one has a curved tip, so you can put your finger on it. You can get straight ones that um, I use like a vegetable peeler. So I'll, I'll show you both ways. Um, the curved ones, you can put your finger on it, and you're basically going to run it round the top. Here. <coughs> if you don't have a curved one, I use it like a vegetable peeler. So I hook my, hand, my finger into this kind of bit here and I just run it around at an angle. We're basically trying to shine that rub over edge up that we've just pushed over. So you're pushing quite hard. Burnishing also um, work hardens metal. So you're hardening up your bezel as you do this, making the metal stronger. Um, so it kind of does a dual purpose thing of shining it up and hardening it up. Okay. I would do a bit more work on that personally because I set it too low. So I'd actually go in with a really fine butter stick and go around the edge and then re-burnish that because I've got a few tiny little creases. But that's how you set a tube into a, a stone into a tube.